The Path is a teaching series sponsored by World Missionary Evangelism. We hope that this series will deepen your knowledge and walk in our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's your host, John Cathcart. In the last program, we were talking about the first time that Jesus cleansed the temple, and that was at the beginning of his ministry. And when he cleansed the temple, the Jews asked him, and this is a very revealing question, they said, what sign do you give that you are Messiah, seeing that you do such things? Now, that reveals to me two things. The first is that they knew Messiah was going to cleanse the temple. And the second question is, why weren't they doing something about it themselves if they knew it was going to be done and needed to be done? Well, the answer that Jesus gave to the Jews was not the answer they expected. Uh, in fact, it, it seems even to us at first glance irrelevant to the question. Jesus said to the Jews, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Well, the disciples thought that Jesus was talking about the physical temple in Jerusalem. But as the gospel writer John explains, Jesus was talking about the temple of his body. Now the disciples did not realize that at the time, but after he was resurrected, the disciples remembered the words that Jesus said, and then they were familiar with scripture and they got revelation on scripture that pertained to his death and resurrection and they believed on him. Now, Bullinger, the great Bible teacher, thought it was Psalm 16 and verse 10 that was particularly quickened to them. And that Psalm says, or that verse says, Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, nor suffer thy holy one to see corruption. Frankly, I believe it was not one scripture but a whole group of scriptures, many scriptures in the Psalms concerning the Christ and his resurrection that was suddenly opened to their eyes. You know, it's like the two on the road to Emmaus. They knew the scripture. But Jesus opened the scripture and beginning at Moses, that's start the book of Genesis, he, he took them through the scripture, through Moses and the prophets, explaining the things that pertained to the Christ. Now, I'll tell you who's done an excellent work of this, and that is Simpson. Simpson is a, a great scholar and preacher of former times, and he wrote a series of books called Christ Through the Bible. And going through the Bible, book by book, he shows how Christ was revealed in the Old Testament. Now, it's not astounding that the disciples did not immediately understand the words of Jesus because the words of Jesus were of deep significance. Now up to this time there had been but one temple of the true God, the temple in which Jesus was standing when he cleansed it and spoke, the temple that once housed, once housed the visible presence of God known as the Shekinah. Now, the Lord appeared in the temple in his glory, Shekinah glory. It's a light, type of a light, we believe. But in the days of Ezekiel the prophet, the Lord, the presence of the Lord, the Shekinah glory, left the Holy of Holies and stood over the door. And then it left the door and stood over the mountains to the east. And then it disappeared altogether. So the visible presence of God that had been in the temple was no longer to be seen in the time of Jesus. But by the time of Jesus, the Spirit of God was abiding in a temple that was not made with hands, even in the sacred body of the Son of God made flesh. He tabernacled among us. He had a tent like ours and made of the same material as ours. And three years later, at the great Pentecost, every man and woman was to be in their mortal body a temple of the Holy Ghost. And this was to be the central truth. 
This was to be the sublimest privilege of the new dispensation. This was to be the object of Christ's departure and to make it better for us that he should not go away. Now, there's a lot of silly talk in modern times and, and some silly efforts, in my opinion, to talk about rebuild, occupying the, the temple site and the possibility of the Jews rebuilding the temple. What's past is past. That's not going to happen. We are the temple of the Holy Ghost and Christ, who is our head, together with the church, which is his body, is the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit and is the visibility of God. Well, nothing could have been more amazing or more offensive to the Pharisees than the truth that the sacred temple at Jerusalem was no longer to be the place where men were to worship God. Now, they should have known this from the prophet Daniel. They should have known that the true holy of holies was the Messiah himself and not an inner sanctum within a physical temple. But they didn't know it, and they didn't want to know it. Well, there is an indication, however, that the Jews had a much deeper insight into Christ's real meaning than they chose to reveal. It's interesting. It appears that the Jews understood better what Jesus was saying when he said, destroy this temple and three days I'll raise it up. It appears that some of the Jews had a much better understanding of what he really meant than the disciples had. And that often happened. Jesus said things and the Jews perceived that he spoke about them, and the disciples were kind of in a fog. But when Jesus was dead and buried in the tomb, then the Jews came to Pontius Pilate, the procurator, with a remarkable story. They said, Sir, we remember that the de deceiver said, referring to Jesus, we remember that the deceiver said while he was yet alive, after three days, I will rise again. There is no indication that Jesus said that to the Pharisees, to the Jews, or anyone else. At the heart of everything World Missionary Evangelism does is reaching out and saving the lost through sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. We do this through native missionaries. Right now, we have many native missionaries who need sponsors. That's right, partners just like you, who will help them become full-time workers for Christ. That provides this native missionary with the ability to give his life full-time to gospel outreach. We also need Bibles. That allows us to share the word with those we reach in the mission field. If you would like to either sponsor a native missionary or provide the gift of Bibles. Simply call us at said in the last program that when Jesus cleansed the temple, ran, ran out the money changers, overturned the tables, dispersed the flocks and the herds, 
The Jews came to him and said, what sign do you give that you are the Messiah and you are able and free to do such things? Jesus answered with a very strange answer. He said, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up. The disciples of Jesus thought Jesus was talking about the physical temple. But if we look at the scripture closely, do a forensic study of the scripture, the Jews apparently that were talking to Jesus understood what he meant. And so after Jesus was dead, certain Jews came to Pontius Pilate, the procurator, with a strange story and said, Sir, we remember that the deceiver, that is Jesus, said while he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. Now there is no evidence that Jesus ever used such words to them. Even the disciples themselves did not understand what Jesus was inferring until after the resurrection. How then did the Pharisees and the priests have a better understanding of what Jesus was really saying than the disciples did? That's an interesting question for which we do not have an answer. We can speculate, but we don't know. But it does appear that in spite of all their knowledge, their hearts were full of hatred and rejection of the Messiah. But there was yet another meaning to the words of Jesus when he said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The temple was the whole heart of the Mosaic system. And in profaning the temple and suffering it to be profaned by the kind of commerce that they were permitting, were they not destroying the temple and showing by their actions that the real significance of that building as a house of God to them had passed away? So in effect, what Jesus was saying was, and I'll just paraphrase, you finish your work of destruction and dissolution without delay, and in three days I, as the risen Redeemer, will restore something bigger and greater, not a material temple, but a living church. And indeed, this seems to have been Stephen the Martyr's understanding of these words and of the acts of Jesus and the teaching of the Apostle Paul also makes that clear. Well, there's a final fact that demands recognition and that is that the temple in which Jesus was standing was the temple of Herod. And because Herod was a hated Idumean, he was not a Jew, he was an Idumean from Eden, the temple had never been consecrated because of Herod's involvement, which means that the Jews could not truly regard it as the house of God. So what did they regard it as? Well, they must have regarded it as a commercially profitable religious center. They couldn't regard it as the house of God. So they must have regarded it as a commercially profitable religious center. I think we have some of their descendants with us today in the United States of America don't think that sect has ever died. Now, what miracles Jesus did at this Passover time, and you can read John 2 and verse 23, which says, Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. But we don't know. Nobody gave us an account, a list of the miracles that Jesus did at that time that caused many to believe on him. But Jesus did not trust himself to men. 
even though they might say they believe. People do not believe because of miracles, not for long. Miracles are a phenomenon. And there are what we call sensation seekers. People who will go chasing after miracles and phenomena. But those people never get very deep in the Lord. Jesus did not trust himself to men because he knew what was in unregenerate men. And witnessing miracles does not cause regeneration. It may get attention but it doesn't cause men to be changed. But since the Jews had asked for a sign, said, what sign did you give? Why did they not believe in the miracles that he did as being the sign? Well, the answer is that, as a matter of fact, many people did believe in Jesus and believed in the signs. That didn't mean they were going to support him. I believe many people believed he was the Messiah. And that leads us to the subject of one Nicodemus. Now, Nicodemus is described in the Gospel of John as a ruler of the Jews. And by that is meant that he was a member of the Council of Seventy, the Seventy Elders of Israel, or the Sanhedrin. And we read about Jesus and Nicodemus meeting in John chapter 3. And for reasons I'll talk about later, I think this occurred in Jerusalem not long after the first cleansing of the temple. But here's what it says. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that you do except God be with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. For so much of the world and places that world missionary evangelism has missions, water is not there. And when it is, it's not safe. World missionary evangelism for more than 50 years has drilled and dug water wells. And we've done it more than just to supply a community with water. We've done it to save lives. Because the largest killer in most third world countries is fouled or polluted water. World missionary evangelism through our water programs has saved thousands of lives through water wells. Not long ago, we drilled a well in Kenya. And a man who watched the water coming out of the ground an elder in a Maasai community walked up to our president and said, did your God do this? And essentially, yes, he did. It has changed an entire community. That water well began it, but now there's education through schools. There's children's programs. There are churches. There are so many other things going on thanks to a gift of water. The next time you drink a glass of water from your tap, remember, it's pure gold in many parts of the world. The next time you pour a glass of water out, think that you're pouring out something that someone else would treasure more than anything else. segment, we started talking about Nicodemus. I'm going to read from John chapter 3. I think I'll read all verses that pertain to this story. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher sent from God, come from God, for no man can do these miracles that you do except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Truly, truly, I say unto you, 
except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say to you, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Don't marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it listeth, and you hear the sound thereof, but you cannot tell whence it comes and where it goes. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you a master of Israel, and you don't know these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak that we know, and we testify what we have seen, and you don't receive our witness. I have told you earthly things, and you don't believe. How shall you believe if I tell you heavenly things? You can't get past grade one. There is no point in going to grade two. Or there used to be no point in going to grade two. And no man has ascended to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life or eternal life. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is condemnation, that light is come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. For everyone that doeth evil hates the light, neither comes to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that does truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be manifest, that they are wrought of God. Now, there's one great question that needs to be asked about Nicodemus. And the question is, did he come or was he sent? Did he come on his own recognizance or was he sent by the Sanhedrin? Now, we realize that the reason Nicodemus came to Jesus by night was so as not to be seen. But was he acting on his own? Or was he acting as a delegate for and from others? Now, the opening words of Nicodemus were, quote, We know that you are a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that you do except God be with him. Question, just who is this we that Nicodemus is talking about? Is this the plurality of majesty like the British use? Or is he talking about him and some others? Nicodemus was a member of the Sanhedrin or the Jewish Council of Seventy. He was also, as Jesus said, a master in Israel or a master of Jewish law. Now, a lot has been written, silly stuff in my opinion, about Nicodemus being a timid man. And I think that is misguided. I do not think Nicodemus was timid. I think Nicodemus was an excellent envoy for this kind of contact. I think Nicodemus was also a pretty subtle man. You notice he did not say, we know you are Messiah. Nicodemus said, we know you are a teacher. Now this is a non-committal statement. It's not a statement of faith. And when Nicodemus said, we know, 
As I say, he was not using the plurality of majesty. Nicodemus was saying, we, the Sanhedrin, know that you are a teacher come from God. And interestingly, the word that he uses for God, Nicodemus uses, is the word theos. And that means the supreme divinity and figuratively, the word theos means a magistrate and therefore indirectly implies that they knew God, Jesus had come from God in a judicial sense or in a sense of judgment. Now, this is quite a confession. You know, we can read the Bible and you can read it fast and you can read it very seriously and still not get the subtleties that were taking place. What Nicodemus said was quite a confession. And obviously the Sanhedrin wasted no time in making a quick decision about what they should do where Jesus was concerned after he cleansed the temple and worked miracles. And what they decided to do was make contact with Jesus and see where things might be about to go. Well, how did the Sanhedrin know that Jesus was a teacher come from God? And Nicodemus gives us the answer. They knew because of the miracles that Jesus did. So here is another confession. The Jews had asked for a sign and the miracles that Jesus did were the sign the Jews believed not. Many people are shocked when they discover that world missionary evangelism has been building funding and staffing Bible colleges for decades. These institutions of learning offer those called to preach the gospel and share the good news, an educational foundation to better serve God and man. In the courses taught by experienced instructors, students grow in biblical faith and knowledge, as well as in all facets of mission outreach and work. The tools provided by these colleges help build roads of understanding that enable our sponsored missionaries to reach countless souls. Bible colleges, therefore, are just another example of the fact that the evangelism and world missionary evangelism is not just part of the name. It defines our mission, our focus, and is the heart of our work.